Hello and good morning to our friends from the East Coast, the West Coast, and all around the world. Welcome to another edition of the ASMBS Fellow Project webinar. We are very excited to have our speakers today. Before I make some introductions, just want to do some housekeeping notes. Um, we are currently taking abstracts for the ASMBS meeting in June, so please make sure you get those in. I believe the deadline is middle of December. Uh, so we look forward to all of your entries. Um, also, just wanted to mention that at the SAGES meeting in April, um, they'll be offering the testing for Be Safe. Be Safe is a combined course curriculum um, video as well as hands-on testing sponsored through ASMBS and SAGES. It stands for Bariatric Endoscopy Skill Acquisition Focused Evaluation. And ASMBS and SAGES have worked together to develop this verification process um, and it's something uh, that would be really useful, I think, for our fellows moving into their attending hood. So look out for that. Sign up if you're interested. Uh, we think it's something that would be valuable for you. So today we're going to be talking about pediatric and adolescent obesity and bariatric surgery, uh, which is something that's really interesting to me, and I'm very excited to have our experts today. We have Dr. Stephanie Walsh, who is a pediatrician, medical director of Strong for Life Clinic, and associate professor of surgery and pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine. She has led the Strong for Life Clinic since 2008, which is a medical and surgical weight management program. She is leaving academic medicine and has started Intero Health Consulting, dedicated to improving pediatric weight management programs across the country. Dr. Walsh, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Our second speaker is Dr. Dr. Mark Wolkan, who is the chair of the Department of Surgery at ACH and professor of surgery and pediatrics at Northeast Ohio Medical University. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Emory and completed his general surgery residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital, University of Miami. He completed fellowships in critical care at UPMC Pitt Pittsburgh Children's and research in pediatric surgery at UAB Children's of Alabama. Dr. Wilkins started the Adolescent and Pediatric Bariatric Surgical Program at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta in 2004 and moved to Akron Children's in 2020, where, where he grew the first Adolescent and Bariatric Surgical Program in Northeast Ohio. His other clinical interests include minimally invasive surgery in infants and children, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, congenital lung lesions, and disorders of the foregut. He is pediatric editor-in-chief of JLAS and the CEO of the International Pediatric Endosurgery Group. He's published many articles and book chapters, and his research interests include adolescent bariatric surgery, GERD, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and minimally invasive surgery in infants with congenital heart disease. Uh, I think you guys need to do some more. You have too much. You have too much free time. You you, you just need to pick up a few things. Um, very impressive. Again, Dr. Wolkan, thank you so much for being here with us. We will let you take it away. All right. So thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I know this is a little bit different than your usual adult programming. So I'm going to focus what makes work with kids a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the new guidelines that came out and the medications that we've been using and how that's, how that's changed now, integrating it with bariatric surgery. So <laughs> here are the clinical practice guidelines that came out. These have caused so much stir, as you have heard around the country and talking about obesity and eating disorders and exactly how to treat kids and what we have out there. So this document is 72 pages long. The executive summary is 11. I would suggest going in that direction for a read. What was really nice about this is that it also went through the all the different pieces of evidence and what we have to support what we're trying to do to get the most comprehensive care we can for kids. So as they were really, this was a really good start because they were very strong in their comments. And this is part of even just the whole first paragraph of the of the paper, really looking at the fact that this is a very complex genetic, physiological, socioeconomic, and environmental process, and that it's not a personal choice, which is something that I think has been said in the adult world a little bit more, but even less so for kids. It's, it's still, especially here in the South, very much seen as something that you should be able to do something about. It is one of the most chronic common, chronic common chronic diseases of childhood only being taken out by cavities. So just to put it in perspective of what's going on and that it's so important for us to really have access to evidence-based care. As we sort of look at this as a chronic disease, we're really talking about comprehensive obesity treatment. And 
the fact that you may need to treat at different parts of the kid's life, even when they're kids. So this is something that is, is new to, to the obesity world and new to the general public about taking care of obesity in kids. They talk a lot about weight bias and stigma, a lot of focus on the adverse childhood experiences, the you know insecure environments that kids are growing up in and how that is then leading to worse causes of obesity. When they talk about obesity treatment, we go everywhere from these medications, but also a huge focus also on what is an intensive, healthy behavior and lifestyle treatment. And they're really getting away from calling these things programs and focusing on treatments. The issue with this is that we don't have that many programs out there. But what they're saying is as we treat these kids with medications and surgery, that we need to still continue to focus on the lifestyle piece. You may or may not have heard that these programs now need to be a certain amount of time that we've said that it needs to be about 26 hours over three to 12 months, which is just a lot of time and very hard to do in any sort of clinical program. So it's really about the community has to take on some of these programs to provide the comprehensive care. There's been a lot of work done with Parks and Rec in different group formats, all of which are showing really promising results. So even as kids start to get treatment with medications and surgery, this still has to be the main focus of what's going on with their treatment program. One of the things they talked a lot about in the paper is the use of motivational interviewing. What's really important about this and what I think has helped with some of the negative feedback regarding eating disorders is that the use of motivational interviewing when you're discussing weight with children and adolescents is that this actually can lead to a decrease in the risk of eating disorders. So developing your skills around motivational interviewing are really important. And again, this is patient-centered counseling. It's much more of a partnership between you and the families. We're trying to really understand what it is that's going on in their families. And, you know, this is actually a little more I, I'm, I'm going to say complex with kids because you have the child's motivation as well as parents and what resources they have. So sort of really working with the whole family to find some place that you can come together to start working on some goals and just a whole lot of empathy. We all know that teenagers don't always invoke the most empathetic feelings in all of us, but that it's very important for us to still continue to try to do that with them. One thing that has taken over, and I don't know how much you guys are doing this, but really using person first language. So Angela has overweight, Lamar has obesity. A child with overweight or obesity is one of the key components of these guidelines as well. This is something that is really hard to get people to start to do, even people in the field. But the more we can continue to sort of let each other know, maybe we're not doing this as well as we should, the easier it'll be to start changing this. I, I gave an interview a couple of years ago, and when I asked her to please use person first language, she told me that Angela has overweight is not grammatically correct. So she wasn't sure she could do it. And I said, it actually is just you're just not used to hearing it that way. So it, it's still something that just doesn't roll off the tongue the way we certainly hope it will in the future. So one of the main pieces of these guidelines is looking at medications and what has evidence and how do we use them. And these guidelines did not give a lot of directive as far as how to treat any of the comorbid conditions, but it did start to talk about medication use, which was really important and something we've all been looking for. So the medicine that I have as a go-to is fentramine and topiramate, partially because it's cheap and it's easy to start. So this has been one that I've gone to. My issue with this is that I do not have as many varieties of doses that they say that are out there. In um, Atlanta, it's been very hard to get anything that's not 15 milligram, despite the fact that the studies that have looked at this have had lower doses of fentramine in them. But this is what we have. And then going with the guidelines, which basically say treat with the highest intensity you have available, we have, I've gone ahead and used this, knowing that this is this is something that we have to we have to still work on, and I'm hoping that soon we'll have more available. 
So again, the kids take both of these in the morning, as I'm sure they do in the adult world as well. And again, a BMI greater than the 95th percentile. So it covers a lot of kids to get to get started. One of the biggest things about this, as you know, is that it's a teratogen. And then you have the lovely conversation with all these 16-year-old girls and their parents about, please, 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 um, you know, let's let's talk about this. Let's maybe talk about maybe getting on a birth control pill. But um, I do not make everyone get on a pill. I do not do routine or monthly checks of pregnancy. I do, this is a good time to bring up the fact that the adolescent brain is really far from fully developed. And even though a lot of our patients look like they're 20, they're really younger and they've also been more socially isolated. So helping them get where they need to be and have conversations around things like this is, is certainly something that's important. And one of the things that we really focus on in the pediatric world. The GLP-1s are what everybody's talking about, and I have so many people coming in talking about Ozempic and wanting to get on these. Unfortunately, in Georgia, these are not covered at all by the Medicaid popul by the Medicaid CMOs, and so that has led to a significant issue for us with taking with being able to prescribe these. In addition, at this point, we can't find any of the starting doses for Wegovy. So Wegovy is the one that's really been approved down to age twelve, and that's what we've been trying to use with the kids. But it's it's hard. It's hard to get it, and it's just hard to continue to find all the doses as they ramp up to their full dose. It is improved, it's approved for a BMI greater than 30 or greater than 27 with one weight related comorbidity. And for most of us, the injection hasn't been an issue for the kids, even though I think people were initially worried about it because once a week they, they're able to do it because really remembering to take a pill is harder for most of them. So the GLP ones, as you know, you guys probably have seen these and been using them. These are the, the doses and the contraindications. We always send a prescription for Zofran along with it because we do have some kids with the nausea, vomiting. There's a, the recommendation is to check glucose prior to starting. We don't do any hypoglycemia education, but I'm hearing it back and forth about whether or not that's something we should start doing. One of the things that's been difficult for us is that these are medications that some of the kids who've had other chronic diseases want to use, but the risk of pancreatitis has also limited our ability to use that with some of the, the children, particularly with some rheumatologic issues. This medication, bupropion or Wellbutrin, is something that I've used pretty frequently after surgery when the kids do their drop and then maybe start to see some weight regain, this medication has done really well. There's not a ton of research on it out there just yet in, in adolescence, probably because it's only approved down to age 18. But if you can get it approved for the kids, then it actually does really well. Again, we don't need to usually worry about the, the weight because we're using it post-surgery. It also has the other benefits for ADHD and some depression potentiator for other medications. Side effects are exactly as you can see here. Again, thinking again about the disordered eating, making sure that the kids after surgery are still having some really safe eating habits and we're not getting into anything with post-bariatric eating issues as we can have also contraindicated in pregnancy. So something that we continue to have to to talk about. Sleep disturbance is not listed as a side effect. I have had a couple of patients complain about that, but usually it, it's something that's short-lived, but it does come up. Stimulants. So this is what's different for the pediatric world. Obviously we use stimulants for ADHD all the time. And I also am really trying to advocate for the use of stimulants early on for some of the younger kids so that we can talk about their impulsivity around food, but also hyperphagia. I, th I think it's one of the great disservices that we do to little kids who are hyperphagic to not treat their hunger. And because we know the kids who are hungry all the time and or don't get, get along well with their peers because they're thinking and talking about food the other time. They tend to, of course, gain weight, therefore leading to increased weight stigma when they're younger and decrease physical activity. So I think it's really important to think about using stimulants along the way. And sometimes people feel more comfortable 
trying a standard stimulant medication for their kids as opposed to trying um, something else. It's, it's so interesting across the country, the different levels of medication resistance that you have. In Georgia, we have a very high, people don't want to use meds. So we're still really trying to do education around some of this. Vyvanse is one of my favorites. Again, really approved for binge eating, but only over age 18. But it's done really well for some of the younger kids as far as curbing their hyperphagia. So when it comes to bariatric surgery, and I wasn't going to delve into this because I'm going to pass this on to Mark. I think he's going to be taking care of that mostly. But the we still that this is still a mainstay, and I think there's so many kids that really need to be going on this path. I think the medications at this point have had an uptake, but I think that that's going to decrease and we'll see surgery sort of come back up even stronger as people are realizing the benefits of weight loss instead of feeling that it is something they can't do anything about or when all of a sudden they have to be on medications for really the rest of their lives. One of the things about adding medications with bariatric surgery that's so important is because on average, our adolescents that have surgery have much higher BMI. So I think in Atlanta, we're about 55 on average. And the reality is getting those kids down to any BMI below in, you know, as you can see here, only 37% achieved a BMI less than 35 at eight years. And, and I would say we haven't really even seen that, that we see our kids get down. They usually stay above 40 and while that is a significant improvement, is it everything that we need them to get or is that really the best place for them for their health? So the ability to have medications along with surgery, I think, is going to be the long term benefit for kids. But what do the studies actually say? Well, that's great. I think we some, some things are all going to be coming out very soon. <laughs> Ventamine and topiramate are out there and the issue with using some of these is that remember after the sleeve, they're not hungry. And so for me, taking away any extra bit of hunger can sometimes lead to worsening eating habits and not getting in their protein. So I, that's why I tend to net, usually start with a Wellbutrin, but it looks like there are studies coming out that may be proving me wrong. And we'll be starting a little more fen fentamine and topiramate with that. And then there's more studies coming out, particularly with the GLP-1s. So I, I think this is all coming. Unfortunately, I don't have any actual data at this time. And that's my summary for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. We will pass it on to Dr. Wolkan. And please remember, if you have any questions, to put them in the Q&A. I'm going to talk about a little, some more of the specifics around bariatric surgery and adolescents and, and the pediatric population. Uh, I don't have anything to disclose. And so our objectives today, we're going to just do an overview of bariatric surgery in this population. And then what do the new guidelines mean for surgeons? And then talk about maybe some special considerations in the pediatric adolescent population related to surgery. So I just want to give you, a, I'm going to give it, go through this pretty quickly, but um, the model that we use here, and this is actually something that Stephanie and I uh, developed, or I'd say Stephanie developed, and I was along for the ride in Atlanta, where we actually, we, di we didn't have separate surgical and medical clinics. They were actually one clinic and we all worked together. And in the pediatric population, you'll find there are kids that you know, they might be 10 years old and you know they're going to end up in the bariatric tract, but they're in there and they're seeing the same providers, the same pediatric providers, and you can go back and forth. Or if you have a younger kid that's 13, 14, you know, again, they may think they want surgery, then they go to medical, then they come back. So you give those patients the options by having a true integrated clinic. I think it really helps. And in, you know, in our model, I actually, in the, on the surgical side, you know, I know there's different models, um, but uh, on our side, you know, I, I try to see the patients almost every visit to develop that relationship with them. And we truly do team-based care. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I just want to sort of put out there is that from the technical aspect of the operation and the perioperative care, it's really not any different than what you do. So, you know, I, I do a sleeve gastrectomy, we do ERAS, I do a protein sparing fast first. Everybody has their own opinions on how you do that. Uh, you know, for the most part in kids, we do a sleeve 
I mean, I, I haven't done a bypass in years. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if that's because, you know, first of all, I think in kids, we see the sleeve as something that has less co overall complications and left, less lifelong risk of bowel obstruction. But it's also, if you're doing the operation in a kid and they need a revision operation, you can always take a sleeve and revise it to something else. It's a lot harder to revise a bypass or now, or now, now people, you know, if you're doing a SASE or SATI to revise that to something else. So we usually start with a sleeve. If they have severe documented reflux issues or Barrett's, which we don't usually see in this population yet, um, you know, then I would consider doing a, uh, a, a, a bypass or something along those lines. But other than that, we do mostly sleeves. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Tom Inge, who's uh, done probably more outcomes research related to uh, adolescent bariatric surgery than anybody, uh, just looked and saw what procedure we're doing. And this is just, you know, showing you what we all know. And it's the same thing in adults. You know, the sleeves become much more common. Uh, this is old data, but it's uh, true today. Those numbers are probably even more disparate. Uh, and obviously the band has mostly been abandoned. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk about is, you know, how we do that follow-up care and some of the things that we look at that might be a little bit different or some of the things... Uh, Again, that, that you know, you want to work with your pediatric partner uh, in the in the program. Uh, again, a lot of this is the same. Uh, you know, some of us still do an upper GI at one year just to you know to check their anatomy and make sure, especially if there's issues. Um, obviously, vitamins, protein, GERD, GERD surveillance. Uh, I, you know, we can have a discussion about that at the end. I know that uh, you know there's. There's the recommendations that we have, and on the in the pediatric committee of ASMBS, you know, we talked about doing an EGD either at five years or when they transition to you, when they transition to adulthood. Uh, again, that's something else, and we'll talk more about that. That we need to cover in the pediatric domain is eventually transitioning them out, because you know uh, we get fussed at if we see kids over 21. Uh, and certainly over 26 for, uh, I know in our world, over 26 is, is a hard stop. But uh, in a lot of places, it's 21. And even and around 21, we start to transition them to an adult program. As a matter of fact, uh, I transition them to Dr. Dan. Adrian is uh, down, the, down the street from me, so he helps, he helps me with that. Uh, psychosocial, now the psychosocial issues in kids are, I think, are very different than adults. For some of us, that's why we went into pediatrics. For other of you, that's probably why you avoided pediatrics. <laughs> uh, but there are certain considerations that we have around, you know, how do they tell their friends? How do they manage that? Uh, how do you, did I lose my screening, my screen here? You guys still see my screen? Okay, so I, on, on, okay. And, the, uh, the other piece is when you get to college and how do you manage that? So we talked to them, you know, because again, you know, how do you manage the pizza party at, you know, at 2 a.m. after everyone's been out? Uh, and then certainly, you know, alcohol and sex are two other things that we have to talk about. And I know when I was in Atlanta, I left, I left Stephanie to do the, all the conversations with the teenage girls about sex. Uh, and then obviously physical activity and we go through that. But then those follow-up fo foci, while they're the same, at, you know, very similar to what you talk about in adults, but it is it is nuanced for kids. So um, I did steal this slide from Stephanie about the clinical practice guidelines, and I really just wanted to say, what do these mean for us? Uh, so what we're seeing is increased awareness. I think a lot of families didn't know that there were treatments available for kids beyond lifestyle management, uh, and so we are seeing a little an uptick in the number of patients being referred and again i know in the adult world um and again we can talk about this i my understanding is that with all the medications it seems like surgery may have dipped a little bit but again i suspect that that'll bounce back up after people are on medication for a while and you know medications i also think can can help you figure out who's going to be a good responder and who's who's not uh with surgery but again, I think that increased awareness of surgery and medication being available on the pediatric side gets more patients in the door 
Uh, and, and I don't know about in your communities. I mean, when this came out, it, you know, as you all know, it made national news and there were certainly stories done on local news and stuff. Um, I know in, in our particular program, our average BMI, I'm going to say it's only 52. As you know, in uh, a lot of adult programs, uh, it's, you know, 40, 41, 42. There, I've even seen some where they're reporting 39. Uh, but it's, uh, it, again, it's that understanding and, and the guidelines go through this, that you offer a treatment when the patient qualifies for it. So when a patient qualifies for medication, the pediatrician should say, you know, hey, would you like me to refer you to a weight management program uh, or, or weight treatment program uh, to, you know, maybe start medications or maybe consider surgery? Because when they qualify for surgery is when we should operate on them. You know, it's not, you know, I say our app, our average is 52. It's not uncommon for us to have kids in the 60s, 70s. 80s. I mean, I know you have adults that are in these extreme conditions, but, I, you know, in the, in the pediatric world, we see more of it, uh, mostly because everybody sees surgery as a last resort. So changing that paradigm is going to be really important for us. Uh, and then the other piece in there, and this is the percentile-based treatment. I don't know that this really... Uh, affects us that much because most of the kids that we're seeing on the surgical side uh, have skeletal maturity. So the, the standard BMI piece works, but it does help identify those kids because again, the BMI curve is not a straight line, you know, so for younger kids, some lower BMI numbers actually are, you know, 140% over the 95th percentile. I know that's a mouthful, but there are, and the, these weight charts, actually, you can see these in Epic. So for those of you on Epic, I don't know if Cerner has it as well, but there are the special weight charts in Epic that you can look at for kids to see if they qualify. So how many of you, I know this is like, if we were in an auditorium, I'd say raise your hand if your pediatric surgery attending on your pediatric surgery rotation said, children are not just small adults. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, from the surgical standpoint, they are, but there's a lot of other pieces that, you know, might not be, you know, certainly the developmental and emotional considerations, they're developing autonomy, they're trying to figure out who they are. And, you know, and again, I know in the adult world, you're treating the family, but we really, you know, we need buy-in from the parents, need to make sure they have support. Uh, in our world, it becomes one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of our patients, I think, uh, again, Dr. Walsh alluded to it are on Medicaid and they are socioeconomically challenged and they are resource challenged and you have to make sure that they can get what they need to be successful after surgery. Uh, you know, everybody, uh, I, I didn't talk about this. It's, and I know in the adult world, there's some folks that are saying, well, do we really need the six months of preoperative uh, treatment? before you go to bariatric surgery. And I think there's some, you know, there are some studies looking at three months, maybe just as, just as good. In the pediatric world, it's hard for me to imagine that because on average, you know, again, we're looking for readiness for surgery and it's family readiness, patient readiness. And on average, uh, you may say we're overkill, but on average kids are with us usually like nine or 10 months before they actually get surgery. So that's a long time. We're not like six and done. We're not just checking boxes. We're actually doing things. We have a curriculum and we want the patients to achieve, you know, achieve goals. Um, and again, and not, uh, you know, I know you're, you all are in different programs across the country. Uh, you know, we actually do not look at weight. We don't really talk about weight during that, per that pre-op period. You know, we don't make them lose weight beforehand. There's no data that that helps them. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a, a, a little study that we did uh, a while back, but it basically showed the only predictor, the only pre-op predictor of weight loss that we really found was how much weight you lost on the protein sparing fast preoperatively, which to me just tells me that we were just we were showing that people that can lose weight lose weight. Again, it's a heterogeneous disease, and we need to do more work and figure all this out while we have some good responders and some not great responders. Uh, the most common complication of bariatric surgery in adolescent females is pregnancy. So that's something, you know, again, we need to counsel them. Uh, here in Akron, 
Uh, I'm not sure what our OBs do. We have a department of MFM and we have a couple OBs that work with them. And, and one of them is, is does adolescent and pediatric gynecology. And I'm not sure what magic she does, I'm, but I'll, I'd say at least 50% of the girls that come to us and get surgery actually get an IUD in the operating room. Uh, and then, you know, remember all these kids are trying, I know you tell adults, you know, Hey, you're going to get drunk faster. Um, kids who have never been drunk don't know what that means. <laughs> so <laughs> again, that goes to this call, you know, we counseled them on alcohol, what that does and how to be careful. Uh, and then, you know, in our world, we also have special populations. I have a slide that will, uh, at least list some of those special populations where there may be ethical, where there may be ethical, uh, issues or we, it, you may benefit from an ethics consult. Uh, but some of these are kids that have uh, cognitive, uh, you know, cognitive delay and other pieces. One of the other things I want to talk just briefly mention in developmental and emotional considerations is that uh, one of the other considerations and one of the things that we're seeing now as we come out of COVID is that these kids are real, the kids that may, went through COVID in their formative preteen and early teen years or the kids that are presenting to us in the, in, in the bariatric clinic and in, in general, actually across the whole pediatric world, are socially and developmentally delayed. They lost two years of their, you know, or, or more of their lives in, during COVID. So I think that's something. So again, they're even more immature than they were before. Things, just things to consider, and we do want to make sure that they have that, you know, emotional maturity to understand what they need to do and what's happening. Uh, I, I did mention uh, transition programs and transitioning to adulthood. Uh, again, you know, we're dealing with kids that are gaining autonomy, moving away from home. Uh, so we sit down with them, talk to them about, you know, if they're going off to college, we look at a campus map. Where's the, you know, where's their dorm? Where is the, uh, you know, where's the cafeteria? How are you going to manage, you know, how are you going to manage your multiple small meals? Uh, what snacks are you going to carry with you? And again, even and again, talk about how do you manage the, uh, you know, the pizza party at two in the morning, uh, and make, you know, tell them they need to have insurance. I mean, once you have this operation, you need lifelong health care. We all need lifelong health care. That's a whole nother. That's a whole nother topic, but uh, but do they have but do they have insurance to be able to get the coverage they need? And then moving them to an adult program, and and the other piece is uh, you know with the sleeve and the new data with the sleeve is you know make sure that they're getting their surveillance for their uh, for potential esophageal issues related to reflux. Uh, I do want to talk about a little bit about pediatric outcomes, and I think that this might help inform us as to why we do this. Because you can say, okay, you got these kids, you got these families, it's all crazy. You know, why don't we just wait until they're adults and manage them then? Well, one is the, obviously we all know the natural history of the disease. If we're trying to intervene earlier, that's not going to work. Uh, we want to intervene when they when they qualify for surgery, not as a last resort or when they have a BMI of. 60 or 70. I mean, you think about it. So if you really look at weight loss, uh, again, this was out of the teen lab study, and I think it's true in adults world. Also, um, you know, I like to think of total, we all look at this differently. I think of, I think about total body weight loss. And most, most of our patients will lose between a quarter and a third of their weight. So if you have someone with a BMI of 60, an awesome outcome is a BMI of 40, but they still have a BMI of 40. They're much healthier, but again, it'd be much better to get them at a BMI of 40 and get them into the low, mid to low 30s. Or even, or I'm sorry, they're around 30 to low 30s. Okay. Uh, you can't talk about adolescent bariatric surgery without talking about teen labs. Uh, Tom Inge, uh, uh, this guy right here, is the PI. Uh, it's actually closing out. It went through three rounds of funding with the NIH. Tom is now the surgeon in chief at Lurie Children's Hospital. But this was a consortium of uh, five centers that uh, were looking at uh, adolescent bariatric surgery. Uh, and 
modeled it after the adult lab study, which is longitudinal outcome after ba bariatric surgery in, in the teenage or in the pediatric population. It really uh, was a well-executed study. The follow-up rates were incredible. So I think that when we look at this data, we can believe it. Uh, you know, Tom has told me stories about how they would send the crew, like apparently, you know, I don't know, a patient moved to Phoenix or something, and they ended up sending like a nurse into Phoenix to hunt them down and draw their blood and get everything done. So they, I mean, they did really well with the follow-up. Any of you interested in outcomes, out, you know, being outcomes researchers or anything like this, uh, you know, Tom, you know, reach out to Dr. Ian. He's a, he's a master at this. So again, you know, the weight loss so out of the out of the team labs data, it started out just bypass, and then it was bypass and sleeve when the sleeve came into play. Uh, in the pediatric patient population, again, same thing you see in the adult world. Is that difference real at the end? It does show up in every study, but it's within the error bars, uh, and it's probably not clinically significant. But on average, again, their kids, you know, their error bars are somewhere between a quarter and a third of the weight that you lose. Uh, disease remission in, in the pediatric population, we see, you know, just as you do in the adult world, pretty remarkable remission of disease. It still amazes me that the diabetes goes away like the night of surgery. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, uh, the operation works for kids. So, you know, the question is, is if you wait until they're an adult, if you can save them 10 years of having type 2 diabetes by doing this operation, are you improving their health long term? You know, we sure hope so. You know, again, with this data, there there is 10-year data, that, which is the final paper. It's not published yet. But, uh, you know, Aberti told me that the data looks good, and it's very similar to what we've seen all along. Uh, as, as you guys know, the, the uh, you know, blood pressure is a little bit harder to tackle and sometimes dyslipidemia as well, uh, but they, they do resolve. The biggest thing, though, for the, these kids is really the psychological comorbidities that resolve. Uh, again, weight-related quality of life uh, does improve pretty significantly. Uh, you know, when you take a look at the adults, so what, what, what was done, this is a paper uh, looking at teen labs versus labs. So again, they tried to match the patients as close as they could. So the cohorts they analyzed were just bypass patients. Uh, and so you're looking at teen labs patients versus labs patients and to see if there was a difference in outcomes or anything else. Uh, as you can see, weight loss really uh, was uh, no different uh, across the board with the, with the teens or the, uh, uh, or the adults. But the interesting thing is that diabetes and hypertension was more responsive in teens. So what it shows is that, and again, this, is, this has been known in the medical world for a long time, with medications and stuff, the earlier you intervene, the better off that the kids are going to be, and the better, the higher the chances are that you will reverse the disease. Uh, to me, it's actually interesting that this happens with diabetes also, because in the in the diabetes world, actually, the kids that get diabetes at a younger age actually have a worse disease burden. So, if you look at the natural history of it, they actually do worse long-term. So if you can help those kids, you're going to do even more help long-term. And again, you know, similar complication rates, you know, bleeding, leak and such and everything else was pretty much the same across the board. Uh, the other piece that is really interesting, uh, and this, this is a uh, look at, this is a different study, not the teen labs group, but going into the teen labs data is, is looking at does, does the weight loss itself, cause the comorbidity reversal. So th these are two cohorts of patients, uh, one group that they call high responders that had higher weight loss and then poor responders that had lower weight loss. Uh, and on average, uh, the poor responders lost 26%, the high re higher responders lost 34%. And interestingly, uh, in most metrics, there was no statistically different uh, no resolution. There was no statistical difference in the resolution of comorbidities across those two groups. Uh, the only one that had a difference was uh, the dyslipidemia, and the patients with the higher weight loss actually did better. 
and everything else, whether it was diabetes, uh, GFR, uh, blood pressure, musculoskeletal pain, believe it or not, there was no real statistical difference. Uh, the last thing I want to bring up, and I know we're coming up on, on time for the discussion, but I'm going to throw this out there uh, it's, it's just as maybe prompts for questions from the audience. But, you know, we, we see a lot, we see patients with Down syndrome, we see Prater Willie, uh, hypothalamic obesity in kids that have had, you know, pituitary tumors and other, other issues, uh, and then obviously leptin resistance and such. And we've, we've had experience with most of these populations. Let's say, for example, we take Prater Willie, um, you know, they don't respond quite as well, but some of these kids, it's, you know, you get to the point where it's the risk benefit ratio and it's, you know, some of them, some of them do okay. They'll lose some weight, uh, but yet there's uh, other studies uh, that was a that show that you know in Prater Willow they might regain all the weight, but do you help them by having ten years of a little bit less, or are there patients that will have more long-term weight loss? With all of these, the the biggest series are usually like five patients. So again, with these special populations, and again, this is where the ethics board comes in and other you know, other ethical issues about whether we should be doing this uh, come into play in this population. The interesting thing is what I'll tell you is that we've had several kids that have, have that have cognitive delay, and we actually find that that group of patients does exceedingly well because they're very concrete and they listen to you. So, <laughs> so it's not all, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, obviously you can't do a bariatric surgery lecture without showing at least one question, one picture or one of a patient. Uh, but, uh, and then, uh, so that's it. And I guess we'll open it up for questions. Let me yes. Sure. Thank you so much Very to nice both time. of you. Uh, those were fantastic lectures. I learned a lot and I know, um, you actually sparked my interest in looking into more things to, to research and look into in this population. Uh, I'd like to hand it over to my co-moderator, partner in crime, and spectacularly talented all-around um, friend and colleague, Dr. Shana Eckhouse, is going to lead our Q&A. It looks like we already have quite a few questions lined up. Yeah, uh, Dr. Welsh, I will admit I, I started a fangirl over here as you assigned yourself a question uh, from the <laughs> Q&A. So, Thank you. Um, uh, fantastic talk from both of you. I have had the pleasure of working um, as a part of a comprehensive, I'm an adult bariatric surgeon, but I do adolescent bariatric surgery and have been training a couple of pediatric surgeons at St. Louis Children's um, in my pr uh, previous job and working with the Healthy Start Clinic and Denise Wolfley. So, so excited to have so many questions, but let me start with the one, Dr. Walsh, that you already assigned yourself. Um, because I, I think uh, I had a couple of follow-ups to that as well that I was curious about, but um, you know, a patient comes into clinic, not necessarily understanding what they're most interested in for obesity care. Um, how do you, um, you know, start that conversation when parents and the child are asking for advice together? Uh, that's actually some of my favorite time because then I know we're looking at family changes. So mm -hmm. we obviously at children's don't do adults, but it's a great start for us. Like it, because otherwise we're having the conversation of these are family changes in general. So when people are, everybody is interested, it's actually very, very helpful. Yeah. Makes it even easier. What you, yeah. So the part that I've really struggled with, and I'd really be curious is what if the parents don't agree? Maybe both parents are there or one isn't there, but you hear as you're, you know, it's easy to tease out, I think, after a good 20 minute conversation that the family unit isn't aligned. How do you approach that? So that's, and that actually happens all the time. And I usually start by thanking the parent that is not ready, like to say, like, I appreciate you being concerned about this because who would want their kid to have an operation? Right. And so to have that fear is OK. So I really try to normalize the fear, because mostly it, it almost always comes from love and fear. And so if you can find that that common piece, it, that really is helpful. And sometimes it just takes some time. And, you know, you give them things to read and you bring it back in. I mean, I have one family who I thought we were all on the same page and mom just came back and said, I still don't know that I want it. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I said, well, let's do it. And then, you know, now and then I'm hoping that she's going to get you. But my daughter's done it. We've done the research. You, you know, you, you get to know the team. 
So you just sort of take the time with them. Like, like Mark said, nobody's having surgery that quickly. On average, it's 10 months or so. Um, so it, it, we have plenty of time to work with them. And I think not rushing them and not quote unquote, forcing anything on them, so to speak, is, is really the key to getting them there. Uh, thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, that's quite, quite frankly, helpful uh, advice. I mean, as a practicing surgeon who's been trying to figure out sometimes how to navigate those tough conversations, because, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, assuming good intent coming from a place of love is usually what's going on, but in the moment can be hard to realign yourself. So I, I appreciate those words. Um, we did have a question in the chat about pregnancy. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I, th I think we could expand it not just to surgery, but to medicine as well, considering weight loss increases risk of pregnancy. Um, uh, for bariatric surgery and for obesity medication, both. So we'll start with surgery, um, Dr. Wilkin, and then maybe Dr. Walsh, you could comment on the medicine side and lifestyle change management. What's the time frame for increased pregnancy rates in adolescents after surgery or medication initiation? Is it 12 months, 18 months? How would you um, answer that and counsel patients? So, I, I mean, I can only give you anecdotal experience. I, I, I may even, Stephanie may help, have to help me remember all of these. I, I know, I, I want to say that it was somewhere around a, a year or less. I mean, it was less than a year that the girls got pregnant the, that I'm thinking about. But we've only had a handful. And like, since I've been in Akron, I, like I said, we've been, really fortunate with the, uh, you know, with the uptake of IUDs. Uh, and I do believe I, I, there is a, there is a paper out there about that, but I, I or at least I, it was either a paper or a presentation. It may have been a presentation. I saw it at ASMBS or something like that in the past. I don't remember when it was, but I don't know. Stephanie, can you help me? I don't remember the paper. And actually I think Tom has one that's coming out pretty soon with sort of updated information about, when the pregnancies are happening. For us, it's been a little bit later, usually. And, and actually, ironically, people who wanted to get pregnant. So that's part of the, the issue, despite, um, yeah, I had one patient who came in because she turned 20 and she was pregnant and she said, look, I made it out of the teens, you know? So <laughs> that was her, her thing. But I think that the whole thing about the pregnancy with the teenagers is the same thing with the alcohol is, they really, their brains are not developed and to continue to remind them and have those conversations and say things very clearly and repeatedly. You know, every time they come in to me, if they're on the Fentramine and the Tepamax, I say things to them like, hey, remember, this can cause problems. Your baby will not come out normal. So just please. So it, it's a lot of repetition. I mean, you know, like Mark said, when, when you, you haven't ever experienced any of that, and there are a lot of girls out there who have not experienced even any positive feedback about who they are as a person, never mind their own sexuality. So with the weight loss comes this sort of 17-year-old body hormones with somebody who hasn't even been socialized past like 13. So there's just lots of, lots of social stuff for us to talk about with that. I mean, I had a, a girl, particularly with alcohol, who said she didn't necessarily believe me. And she woke up on the floor of a fraternity house. Again, terrifying. Thankfully, not sexually assaulted, but terrifying. And it's because this idea that you, you won't understand how you're going to feel about things, you won't even understand how you're going to feel about a relationship and another person is, is, is just, it's just risky. And it's teenage behavior in general. Yeah. I, I kind of to add to... Maybe the, the emotional development that uh, children are undergoing in, in a little bit different light. Um, how do you think bullying affects a kind of the patient evaluation or is that something that you talk about specifically um, either prior to surgery, prior to medication management afterwards? How do you navigate that? Cause I, I think that adds so much to some of their emotional uh, uh, lack of emotional growth, if you Absolutely. will, especially Absolutely. coming out of the pandemic. We have a new patient packet that they fill out ahead of time and bullying's all over it. You know, so we, we do make sure we address that right away because we also have uh, over half our kids are homeschooled and that was before COVID. And a lot of it is due to bullying. A lot of it's due to, well, I can't fit exactly in the seats 
at school. So I don't want to be there. I don't know. I know people are looking at me. None of them eat at school because people are looking like, so even if it's not explicit bullying, there's all the subtleties of, of carrying around all that extra weight. So it is something we address right away at every visit. And some of it's skill building around how do you cope with this and how do you then tackle it? And, you know, and then also, again, like Mark was saying, do we, do you tell your friends you're going to have surgery? Do you not? There's, so much of that, um, which is why I really feel looking at these kids and knowing their age is so important because they do look so old and it's so hard to remember that this person is 12 as opposed to 18. Yeah, that's a really important reminder. Um, question, uh, kind of last q and well, second to last q and question. Um uh, specific to response uh, of diabetes in adolescent populations, um, uh, there was a question about whether you're seeing a difference in response of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Can you tell um, following sleeve gastrectomy or bariatric surgery in general? So for, you know, most of the kids we see are type 2, but we have operated on some kids that have type 1. The interesting thing is in the type 2 diabetics, you know, they all come off insulin immediately post-op. It's very similar to the adult, you know, world. Uh, and for the most part, they'll come off of, all, of everything. If they're just on medications, we take them off everything in the periop period because you're worried about hypoglycemia and everything else going on. But it's interesting is a lot of them don't go back on anything. Uh, you know, the kids that are on insulin, uh, we've had, you know, unless there were, you know, we've had some pretty significant type twos that come back on a little bit. But uh, I, I can only think of one patient in which that's the case. And, you know, I think uh, the type one patients we always do in consultation with endocrine and they follow, we follow them very closely, but you can, you can do a sleeve gastrectomy on a patient with type one. Uh, do you want to add anything, Steph? Yeah. And they very frequently decrease the need, the insulin levels. Like a lot of times when the kids come to us, they're requiring super high levels of insulin, which is also weight promoting. So if we can get those lowered, that's, that's helpful. Right. Um, a question in the chat, uh, kind of related to social media you know, there's a huge rise in social media. Um, how uh, there kind of maybe a two pronged approach to this question. Um, do you believe we should be utilizing social media better to find parents, who uh, patients who qualify for medical weight loss and surgical weight loss? And then on the flip side, are there negatives to social media in our patient population? Yeah. I guess, yes, to both from my standpoint. I mean, I think getting it out there so that people know that this is an option, that there are treatments that more importantly, to get them to realize that it's a disease and it's not something for them to be ashamed of or hide from the medical community for. And when they go to some of these programs, they're going to be met with a positive experience. That to me is really important. And I think that's what these programs do for some kids and families is really shift their relationship with the medical community, because I think it's been hugely negative. Um, from a negative standpoint, my I, I have goals with my kids all the time for the patients. And I say, just bring me the TikTok. Just bring it to me so we can talk about it before you try it. <laughs> and, that's, and that's all you do. You have them like shared. I mean, most of them have my cell phone. They'll send me TikToks. What do you think about this? And then I can respond. So I think it's just being open that it's out there and to again, not shame around it and not do it. But I, you know, I, I had one patient, literally, we did have the goal, do not try anything until you bring it to me. Like that's because that's what he was doing. And again, you have to remember what's that place. He's coming from a place of, I really want to lose weight. I want to be healthier. And so you have to respect that piece. And that just makes a lot easier. And then he sends me all this stuff and I'm like, I never knew that was out there. And it just makes me a better doctor because then I know what, what's out there and what I can, you know, what I need to tackle. So. Um, let's go for it. I was, I was just gonna echo that. I mean, it's interesting. Some of our, so the patient I showed you a picture of Riley has it, it, what actually the local news did a story on her and she posted stuff on her own social media and has a large following. I have to say that we probably got 10 patients because they saw Riley on social media. <laughs> so I, I do think that, that again, and what she talked about was that positive experience that she had. And I think that, so, you know, social media is a tool. It's agnostic to feelings. It's agnostic to good or bad. 
that can be used for either. So I, I think that, you know, again, you can, you know, certainly I know our hospital system, we, we put out social media and we try to put out good information. Uh, but then, you know, we also have a whole generation of people that get all their information you're saying on TikTok and Instagram, and that needs to be tempered uh, again, because it can cause a lot of harm. Uh, Dr. Wolken, I'd be curious to have the second part of this question um, is how do you incorporate adolescent uh, patients into your practice? So um, for our uh, fellows who are about to graduate, yeah. um, how do they set up the practice if they're interested in helping patients? What are your thoughts? That, that, that is, that's a fantastic question. And uh, I probably should have gotten into that in the slides a little bit more, but it's so much because you told me only 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. yeah. I, th I think, I think it, you know, first of all, as far as requirements for a pediatric program, you need a pediatric partner. So, you know, you need, you need somebody who understands this, uh, you know, Dr. Walsh is, you know, fantastic pediatrician. She's ABOM certified. Finding an ABOM certified pediatrician is not always the easiest thing, but I think there are more of them. The section on obesity at the American Academy of Pediatrics is growing. And there is a, a cadre of pediatricians interested in this, and it's really getting getting them engaged and going. And every almost every children's hospital in your community uh, is going to have some weight management program, and it's partnering with them. The other piece of this that is not part of the sort of requirements to have a pediatric program uh, in the pediatric center of excellence piece is. I personally feel that it is critical to have a pediatric psychologist. You know, your adult psychologist is mm. not going to be the same as a pediatric psychologist, but also a pediatric nutritionist, a pediatric exercise physiologist. Again, and, and I don't, you know, you're obviously not going to be able to recapitulate, you know, financially or otherwise your whole program, depending on how busy you are. But if you get busy enough and you can get your system to give you, you know, one day a week or or one day every other week to cohort your pediatric patients. I think that's going to be critical because again, all these psychosocial pieces and all of all the, you know, the way we talk to kids and to have, and the other, and to have people that are motivational interviewing trained. Um, I still struggle with it. You know, Dr. Walsh, it just sort of flows out of her mouth naturally. Uh, you know, I think you, you trained me, what about 20, <laughs> you know, probably, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that on how to do it. And I still, I still struggle, whereas it just kind of flows out of, you know, it just flows from you. But I, I think that it's really important to, to use those techniques across the whole team, making sure the whole team is trained. But I, I'm a strong proponent of having a completely pediatric team. Uh, I think that you as an, as a surgeon that does adults can all can do this. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying certainly there's not enough pediatric surgeons interested in this to do all of it that needs to be done. Uh, if you look at adolescent bariatric surgery across the country, it's mostly done by surgeons who primarily take care of adults. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, one of one of my goals is to help you and give you the tools to do that. The other thing I'll say is if any of you want to start a pediatric army or program or you get somewhere and you have any questions, uh, our contact information is in our slides. I don't know if you get our slides. Like, I, I mean, I've got, you know, you can have my cell phone number. I'll tell you, it's 404-275-0007. I mean, you can call me anytime and I'm happy to talk to you and discuss, you know, how you might be able to do that. And I'm sure Dr. Walsh will be willing to do the same. And I think it's a matter of knowing where you're weak. So what are your skill sets particularly? And then where do you need help, right? So just take an honest evaluation, maybe ask somebody else who knows you well enough will say that to you. You know, if it's really in this area, then get somebody to help in that area. Yeah, I think finding that partner. So we built a, a our Healthy Start Clinic at St. Louis Children's run by Jenny Sprague, super interested in obesity medicine and obesity lifestyle change management. They have the gamut. They didn't have a pediatric surgeon who had time. And so uh, and then I happen to come in and say, hey, let's do this. And so the best part about it is I have everybody who's a spe pediatric specialist engaged and interested and helping to navigate not only the population that can be a little bit more challenging so I can learn, but also navigating the politics of the hospital, which are going to be typically different uh, for a children's hospital compared to an adult hospital. You can practically get the resources you need to not only start a program, but then to sustain and grow a program. And that's not a one-year process. That's like a five to 10-year process. 
but it's the starting point that becomes really important. And those building blocks, I think that relationship is so important to start with that both Dr. Walsh and Dr. Wool can mention. Well, it's 8.02 and I didn't get to the last question, which was going to be related to um, POMC, PS, uh, PCSK9, leptin receptor deficiency in Prater Willie, but we can maybe <laughs> save it for the afternoon. Um, we really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic Q&A. Um, Dr. Jane Spangler, take it away. Just a, a, a very big thank you um, from all of us. We really appreciate your time, your expertise, your skill, your knowledge, and um, most of all, being here and being so open and so available. Um, that was really a fantastic talk. So thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. You too. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for all for joining us today. Uh, special thanks to our experts, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Wilkin. Uh, I'm Freshie, one of the bariatric surgeons down in Pennsylvania. So, a um, lot of food for thought. I don't know, I need to go and do a lot more research. I'm sure our fellows benefited. So, if you have any questions, please uh, write in the Q&A. Uh, as of now, I didn't see any questions, so that means to say we get to ask you guys a little more. Um, so my first question was to Dr. Wolkat. Now, I know you predominantly do uh, sleeves, and that's what um, most places do. And I know from the adult literature and in my practice, what we see is 20% of our patients who have had sleeves end up having acid reflux. Most can be managed with medications, but... In our institution, there's a 5 to 7% uh, rate of conversion to uh, bypass. Have you seen that? Um, yeah, so I, I have not seen that large of a conversion rate. Um, as a matter of fact, I have one patient that I'm thinking about it, but it's not even clear to me that it's it, it, it may not, be, it may be something a little more insidious or maybe even psychological. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so again, some of that's sometimes hard to tell, uh, but, you know, if a patient has really severe reflux, I will discuss with the parents the options, and I always say that we can convert you to one of the anastomotic procedures, and if they, you know, usually everybody's like, okay, we'll try the sleeve, because I've had, it. I mean, we probably all experienced this, you know, I think and again, I don't know what the magic is. There's sometimes patients that have reflux, you do a sleeve, it's sort of like doing a collis, right? right? Their right, reflux right. gets better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I wish I, I, wish, I, I wish I could take credit for it. And I knew what I was doing to make that happen. I think, I, you know, we all think we're doing things to make that happen, but we really haven't seen that, you know, uh, the same numbers that you've seen in the adult world with reflux. I have some kids that, you know, yes, there are some kids that stay on anti-reflux medications, but nearly all of those are kids that were on anti-reflux medications to begin with. Uh, I do not consider pre-op reflux a contraindication to a sleeve because my feeling is that you can always convert to, right. you know, you, you can always convert them and and fix it. What about if a patient had an essence complication? Uh, and I know pediatric populations does do have yeah. essence uh have you so, had, had any encounters with that? So surprisingly, I've only had one patient that's had a fundo that I've done a sleeve on and did okay. It didn't get a leak. Um, that's awesome. Um, yeah. But uh, and it, the 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 fundo had already halfway come undone, so I I, I didn't redo it, and the kid did fine. But it it's the uh, the that it's interesting because we used to do tons of fund applications and now it's sort of like the adult world it's it's a it's an operation that's dried up uh, we we do occasionally do them but not like we used to it used to be if a kid burped or if you're neurologically impaired and getting a g-tube you got a fundo not anymore the gi docs are managing it medically now okay we do have a question uh in the q a i'm just going to read it out how would you approach an adolescent with severe mr autism or who has, has self-harm, has elopement issues and does not understand the rules to follow, but has, uh, uh, you know, obesity. Well, you certainly threw everything in that one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 th I think this might be a, a case study. I think yes. this may be a real patient is what it sounds like. <laughs> 
you know, yeah. I, I think what's what's really nice now is something like that. You could probably figure out a way to manage some things with medication as opposed to going to surgery. I think you're just setting right. yourself up for problems with surgery with that particular case. All right. We have one more question. How do you account for rapid change in height when following BMI curves in adolescents? How does this, uh, does that skew your outcomes? The rapid fall in height? No, the rapid, rapid increase change. in heights and then it's the so, fall so in the majority of our patients have, have reached skeletal majority, uh, yeah. maturity and we okay. don't really see that much height change. As a matter of fact, just like in the adult world, we'll occasionally see height loss because they're, you know, the pads of their feet and they're, and they're because they, because of their wow, weight. Um, but the, uh, and, and the few patients that we've seen that have grown further, it's, it's modest. Right. But I guess if anything, it, it helps our outcomes, but. Uh, <laughs> and I also think you need to think about where the weight distribution is, because I have had kids who are able to stand to get their height measured because their legs can get closer to. Interesting. Right. right. So if yeah. you think about that, so once they slim down, they're actually standing taller. Yeah. So I, I and you have to remember from earlier in the discussion, uh, back before I changed clothes, uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, that you know, our average our average BMI is in the fifties. So, right. you know, we're, so we're that's seeing really... we're, we're yeah we're seeing a lot of and we see a lot of blouse disease and we see a lot of kids that have uh, joint and mobility issues. Dr. Nath, do you have any questions? Oh, I have a ton of questions. It was a very, very illuminating talk. Thank you for including me. This is quite an honor. I'm, I'm new to the fellowship committee, and uh, uh, I find adolescence really challenging. My youngest patients have been 18, but I found that I was vastly underprepared for their needs. I, I wonder what you could offer to those listening what do you need in your program if you're going to tackle an 18-year-old? I mean, I found that I was not prepared for some of the discussions and some of their needs, communications with families. What What would you recommend as like the, uh, you know, the graduating fellow who's going to start in practice and an 18-year-old is going to show up in their office? What What should they have on hand? What's What's the list that you two would recommend? Top five, maybe. Well, you know, I'm going to recommend a pediatrician, but with that <laughs> being said, I, I think going back over some of that development from like 13 to 18 and looking for some of those milestones, really diving into what it means to have executive functioning and not, because that's a lot of what the, those kids can't, they can't follow the directions the way you think they can. And just because they're 18, if they've been struggling with weight, most likely they've also been socially isolated and they might be socially closer to 14. And that is a whole different ballgame because then they also don't have the same social support. They don't have the same understanding about alcohol and sex and relationships and all of that. So, and, and just because they're 18 doesn't make them any smarter than they were at 17. So just, just remembering that piece that they, they are still really struggling and the frontal lobe not done. Yeah, so I, I was going to say top five things. Number one would be to have Stephanie there to help you out. <laughs> we just need to flow now then. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think that it's important to have a, you know, your your support if you if you can. And again, we all can't have this, but if you have access to a pediatric psychologist, they have, you know, they know how to help, they know how to help us manage the patients and manage the families. Uh, and that's going to be, they're going to have a skill set that's different than the adult psychologist. Even if you have a pediatric nutritionist, if you have a lot of pediatric patients in your practice, my suggestion would be to try to cohort the clinics so that you can, you know, if your institution allows you, or if you can go to the children's hospital, if you're, if you're part of a, a large health system that has a children's hospital, say, hey, can I borrow these people for half a day to see my, you know, five patients that are, you know, that are 18 or young adults? Uh, I do think with with COVID, we're seeing in the pediatric world huge issues with behavioral health and you know developmental and social maturity related to COVID. I mean, it's 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 the wild west right now in, in our world, and uh, having 
the resources to deal with that and understanding that that 18 year old may socially be a 14 year old, uh, I think is going to be very helpful and to have whatever support you can to help take care of those patients. Um, and a follow up related to the psychological support. Um, attended a lecture that was really interesting years ago at the ASMBS, and it talked about the uh, incidence of sexual abuse in these pediatric population. How do you approach that? How do you recommend we approach that as surgeons? Do we do we not even try to get at it? But if we miss it, it's going to increase their rate of the weight coming back because we, we have an unaddressed psychological issue. Oh, yeah. And there is a really large... So, um cohort of kids who have experienced abuse. It's a little like um, any other sort of trauma that the kids are going through. I don't know if you do any screenings for those kids. We thankfully have a psychologist, but I think you open up the conversation. You know, she asks all the time, like, so tell me if there's any other history, any history of abuse in your family, anything that you think you should share from the past, anything like that. You can you open up those conversations. You just have to be ready to hear it. Right. And be comfortable with asking the questions because you're not there to fix it, but you need to know it's happening. And that's something that we get really anxious with. And we don't ask something if we can't like offer referrals right away. But it is something that we just need to kind of say, listen, I, you know, when I do this, sometimes I have to ask some questions that may seem a little tough. Is it okay if I share that if I ask those? And when they're ready and they say yes, you can say, I'm just wondering if there's been any history of abuse in your past, anything, you know, anything with the family history, any traumas we should know about, all that can impact your overall health. I have seen that in my practice, especially uh, the younger ones. So I, I do see 18 year olds, but anyone below 25, you just start exploring a little bit and then you go and ask them, how was it growing up? How did you feel? And then slowly this starts coming up. Just be prepared with the box of tissue because then you're opening up mm -hmm. and you cannot finish your consult in half an hour then. So you know you need to allocate time. And um, I do send a referral like to the psychologist sending them a note, but I don't know if I need to do anything further than that. Just kind of sending a quick note to the uh, psychologist saying, hey, we need to kind of address this issue. Okay. Often they have, uh, I feel like often they feel the need to eat so they don't look attractive. Uh, I'm sure you've encountered that too. Mm -hmm. So that, that's well, There's not moment. anything, anybody who has any history of self-harm. Um, we have a lot of kids with what we call more passive suicidal ideations and things right. like that that don't have a plan. And, you know, some of this is us feeling comfortable having these conversations because that's usually the biggest, the biggest starting them. I feel like my these patients open up a lot more to a female provider than male providers. Uh, there's a running joke in my office that, oh, somehow I attract all these patients. I just think I, I explore them a little bit more than, say, my male counterparts. So do you have any yes, more questions? I used to just oh. say, Stephanie, you need to go in. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a Stephanie in our office. Um, I do have a practical question, again, for the fellows that are graduating and maybe for for uh, Dr. Sharif and myself. Do you routinely ask the parents to step out at any point? Ooh, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, you did. And I and I warn them. First visit, we let them know, you know, because I do the whole setup of this is, you know, your kid's journey and all that sort of stuff. And then I say, and we're going to kick you out at some of these visits. So just for you to be prepared. And I would say 90% of them are pretty happy because they're tired of, you know, getting into fights with their kids about stuff. The ones that are not, then you need to sort of just explore that going, you know, just tell me a little bit more about why this is feeling so uncomfortable for you. And maybe we can find a way to move forward with this. I had a question a question for you, Dr. Walsh. Uh, I know you, you talked a little bit on the comprehensive obesity treatment and you showed that picture um, for the lifestyle modification. I think kids go to school and school plays a huge role in this, including the lunches that are provided. I was shocked to find my son say that nachos and cheese is a lunch. Yep. So 
do we have any initiatives where we kind of reach out to schools and kind of educate them a little bit more on how to address these needs, not just for our patients who have obesity, but in general for kids? In general. So ironically, the school lunch is a lot better than it used to be. So, really? can, but it's still not. Good. And, you know, that's a federal issue. So that's part of the problem is it really depends on who's in power as far as, you know, what to do with that. On a local level, you can work more with things about how they offer the food because they might not have as much choice in what they serve. So for instance, instead of saying, do you want a vegetable? You can have, have the care cafeteria workers say, do you want peas or you want carrots, right? And to make sure right. when, the, when everything is set up that the fresh fruit is right there to be grabbed. The water is in front, that, you know, chocolate milk's in the back and all those sort of things. And you can, you can do things like that on that level. And um, most schools are having wellness policies now. So unfortunately it doesn't allow for quite as broad an impact as we would hope, but it, it, it's coming in different, folks are doing it in different ways. Any further questions? And I, I have I have one. If uh, if it's not too late to add a complication question, um, I was thinking about how horrible it would be to manage a complication in a teen. But um, I thought it was really interesting when you said in your talk that the most common complication was pregnancy. So how how do you, <laughs> I can't even imagine how you would manage that? Any any pearls or recommendations? Yeah. You, so we talk about sex all the time in clinic and it's so much so that they always joke, like, you know, they'll come back in and post off and be like, Dr. Walsh, I told you I'm not having sex. Right. First of all, before I even ask them, but just keeping those lines of communication open and trying not to um, trying to trying to keep it because they, they are actually a lot of the girls are feeling so much more beautiful with weight loss and fitting into more of what society considers beautiful and therefore being putting out there more and all you can do is, is be there. But that's why I talk a lot about the vitamins, making sure they're taking their vitamins, the health of babies and that kind of a thing. But it's, it's just vigilance on the topic. And when it does happen. Yeah. You get them right into somebody. And then you also see if there's anybody like maternal fetal medicine, like somebody kind of who understands us a little bit more. I think they need specialty care because they're, teenagers so they're you know I always joke they're kind of dumb by definition but so they're going to need extra help to be able to manage some of the stuff and they can't prioritize they can't remember to take their vitamins never mind the other pieces which is why everybody is pushing for all the larks and the long-term uh, birth control options just yeah, another Go ahead, I was just going to say now, you know, where I am now, we, we send all the girls, we give them the option of meeting with our uh, pediatric gynecologist and, you know, she works magic. And I was, I think almost half of them get IUDs while they're in the operating room. Wow. And it, yeah, I, I'm not, not quite sure how we get such good uptake, but, uh, it's, yeah. we, we, we don't have as good uptake in Atlanta. We probably have about 25%. Yeah. 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 Uh, last question. We have one more minute. Uh, Dr. Wilka, in terms of follow-up, right, uh, do you follow up with them more often than, say, in adult world where we see them at one month and then at three months and six months? And most often these are nurse practitioners who are seeing them. And at what point do you transition to sending them to the medical side after surgery? Yeah, so, so the beauty of the clinic, you know, when Stephanie and I, he set up the clinic in Atlanta. And then when I came up here to Akron, Ohio, uh, is that it's one clinic. And so all the bariatric patients, whether they're pre-op, post-op, are seen on the same day with all of us. Oh. And I actually see all the patients on all their pre-op visits too. So I'm there for all six visits now. Do I do I make it to every one of those? Probably not. Um, uh, you know, Stephanie didn't let me get away with it as much as Marty Walston does up here, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, again, it's 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 a team sport, and I I really feel like the relationships that you develop with those patients really secure you through. I mean, the first time when when we at one point I tried doing you know the the initial visit, the pre-op visit, and all that, and here I am getting ready to go in the operating room, and I, it's like it 
like here I am with a kid and I'm doing this big operation that I didn't really feel like I knew. It just felt uncomfortable to me. So maybe I'm treating myself, but there are a few of us in the pediatric surgery world that'll see them every visit. There's a lot to do it like you do in the adult world. Post-op, um, I, I'm there I'm there for every post-op visit. So we do one, three, six, nine, and 12 months. And then we say annually thereafter, but some reason we always make an excuse to see them at 18 months. Uh, you know, we did that in Atlanta. We do that up here in Akron, Ohio. <laughs> We just like seeing our kids, uh, and and then and then we start talking about transition, you know, transition of care. But they never go like back to the medical side. But our medical teams, the same as the surgical team. So we have patients, right. you know. So if we have a ten year old that we think is going to be on the surgical side, you know, they're going to be on the medical side, but they may bring them on a bariatric day just so they can meet some people and get, yeah. You know. So it 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 really adds a lot of flexibility to the program and flexibility for the patients. Those pre-op visits with us are not, it's not like six and done. It's not checking a box. We have, you know, we all have defined curricula and we want to make sure that the patients understand this. And and not only that, because we don't just have the patient, we have the family too. So, right. you know, there's, a, there's a, we I don't know, I feel like it's a lot of moving parts, which is why for us on average, I think it, during the presentation, we said, you know, it's nine or 10 months on, on average. Perfect. Thank you. It's four or two. Uh, thank you guys for coming back on again. Thank and you. This was really stimulating. Thank you again.